We'll be looking this morning at James chapter 3, the first 12 verses. And if you're willing and able, please stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. James chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. This is the word of the Lord. 100,000 words. 100,000 words. That's how many words I was told to write some seven years ago when I moved my family to New Zealand to begin my doctoral studies. 100,000 words. I had three years to complete the project. And at first, the task seemed daunting. I didn't even know if I knew 100,000 words to begin with. And I certainly didn't think I knew enough about my subject to write 100,000 words. But as time went on, I quickly discovered that the problem was not going to be coming up with 100,000 words. The problem was going to be limiting myself to 100,000 words. Because you see, I was reading hundreds of books and developing millions of ideas, but I only had 100,000 words to work with. Couldn't go over the word limit. And so I was forced to learn how to write with precision, to make every word count. Don't say in 50 words what you could say in 25 words and make it just as clear. Don't waste your words. Think carefully about you, what you want to say and state exactly what the evidence will allow you to state. Don't say that something is probable if it's only possible. Don't say that it's certain if it's only probable. Use your words carefully because words matter. Words have great power. Great power. Several years ago, Time Magazine did a story on what they thought were the most, some of the most powerful words, some of the most powerful speeches. Here are some of the words that made their list. See if you agree. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Abraham Lincoln, 1863. Here's another one. My fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Kennedy, 1961. Or just those four little words, I have a dream. Martin Luther King, Jr., 1963. Words are powerful things. Words are our greatest weapon for good and for evil. Words have the power to bring healing to a conflict. 
They have the power to bring encouragement to someone who is downcast. But words also have the power to bring great destruction, great harm, great damage to a person's life. So the question we must ask is how are we using our words? You've noticed this huge stack of paper, I hope, apparently sponsored by the uh, Dunder Mifflin Paper Company. Not sure who did that, but it's pretty good. I wanted to have 100,000 pieces of paper up here to represent the 100,000 words I had to write, but we didn't have 100,000 pieces of paper in the church office. So the best I could come up with is this, which is about 30,000. 30,000 sheets of paper. Now, I give you this illustration, this image, of course, not because I want you to picture my doctoral thesis, but I want you to think about how you use your words. I had to write 100,000 words in three years, but I'm sure I have spoken so many more words than that. And so have you. How have you been using your words? At times, we think very carefully about our words, we construct them, we design them and get them exactly the way we want them and we think carefully about the effects our words are going to have before we send them flying out into the world. <laughs> but let's be honest, other times we don't think at all. We just ball them up. We just throw them out there. and We don't care who they hit. We don't care what kind of damage they do. We just throw the words with no thought at all. How are you using your words? What sort of effect are your words having on other people? That's what James wants us to consider together today. We're about halfway through this study of the book of James and one of the things we've seen James do again and again is he's called us to action. He's explained to us that authentic faith, real faith, is active faith, hyperactive faith. You can see it. You can see the way that we're living for God in the world. And he's also already talked to us about the importance of our speech, our words. Back in chapter 1, you might remember, he said, Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. He's going to come back to this topic of our mouths again today. He's going to talk about taming the tongue. He's going to talk about putting brakes on the mouth. And more specifically, James is going to do three things today. Here's where we're going. He's going to first talk about how the tongue can deceive us. Then he'll talk about how the tongue can destroy others. And finally, he'll talk about how the tongue discloses the heart. How it discloses the heart. Let's consider each of these in turn. First, how the tongue can deceive us. The beginning of chapter 3 not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now, James is going to zero in, focus in on a group within the church first, teachers. Then he's going to broaden his scope and talk to all Christians. He's going to say all of us struggle with our words at times, but he wants to talk to teachers first and foremost. Why is that? Well, James knows that teachers are wordsmiths. We work with words, and that puts us at a greater risk. We're using words all the time. I get up here every Sunday and preach a 3,000-word sermon or so. If you're a teacher in a small group Bible study here at our church, whether you're teaching children or youth or adults, whatever, you are at a greater risk because you're using words a lot. There are lots of opportunities for you to respond to something out of anger. For you to lead someone astray. And we must be careful communicators of God's word. You know, most of the time when you hear the subject of teaching come up in the contemporary church, how, how do you hear it? You hear a beg for more teachers, right? Please, we need more children's Sunday school teachers. We need more adult Bible study teachers. We want to make it as easy as we can. We're going to give you curriculum. We'll call your class for you. We're going to give you an endless supply of donuts and coffee. Heck, we'll even do your laundry. Just please, for the love of all that's good and decent, teach. But what does James say? 
don't teach. Don't teach unless you're going to take this task seriously. Never take it lightly. He wants to impress upon us the importance of standing before God's people and opening God's word. If you're going to teach, if you're called, and if you're gifted to this task, make sure you're doing it well. Make sure you're glorifying God with these gifts of teaching that he's given you. I have a commonplace book that I keep. I've kept kept it for a long time now where I just write down quotes and thoughts and ideas that I think are worth remembering. And probably since I started keeping this book, I've had a quote in the very front of it from a Scottish theologian named James Denny. He lived a long time ago. And James Denny said this. He said, No person can show that Christ is the most important thing and at the same time show himself to be clever. No man can at once show himself to be clever and at the same time show that Christ is mighty to save. See, in other words, the attention, if you're a teacher, when you're teaching, the attention will either be on you or it will be on Christ. Can't be both. Can't be both. So I want to caution you, all of you who are teachers here at Faith Church. I know the temptation is there to think up something new. To come up with something fancy. To make things happen when you're teaching. Trust God. Trust the power of the Holy Spirit and give people the word. The longer I preach and teach, the more I am convinced of the sufficiency of Scripture. At the end of the day, my words will not help you. They will not. But God's word, that will bring transformation to your life. It will bring healing to your life. It will change you for the better. So give people the word of God, teachers. James wants us to know that we are at a greater risk because we're wordsmiths. We work with words. Now he's going to broaden his scope and he's going to talk to the church as a whole. And he's going to say it's not just the teachers who need to be concerned about their speech. It's each and every one of us. And he's going to give us this list of illustrations now to make the point that the tongue is very deceptive. It's very deceptive because it seems like such a small thing and we think, oh, there's no way the tongue could really bring that much harm. But it can If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. This is why the tongue deceives us. You've heard the saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, words can never hurt me. Wrong. Wrong. Words can hurt you. Words can hurt others. The tongue may be a small thing, but it can cause great damage. James talks about the rudder on a ship, the bit that steers a horse, the rudder that steers a ship. The idea is direction. He wants us to understand that the tongue directs our lives. Or another way we could say that is, your life will follow your lips. Your life will follow your lips. If you are unkind with your speech, you will soon find yourself being unkind with your actions. If you are dishonest with your speech, you will soon find yourself behaving in very dishonest ways. Just like that tiny little rudder steers the entire ship, your life will follow your lips. Don't let the smallness of the tongue deceive you. The second thing James is going to talk to us about is how the tongue can destroy others. He's going to continue giving us illustrations, but now the focus is going to shift more to the harm that the tongue can cause. Not only is it deceptive because of its disproportionate power, but it's a damaging thing if we don't tame it. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, 
and set on fire by hell. How great a forest. We've all heard the stories, maybe even seen it in person. How a great blazing wildfire, it destroys thousands of acres of land and it all started with one little uncontrolled spark. This is the way the tongue works, James says. One word, one sentence can cause so much harm, can destroy someone's family, can end someone's career, can bring such damage and destruction into a person's life. The tongue is a fire. That's easy enough to understand. What does James mean with this world of unrighteousness part? The tongue is a world of unrighteousness. I think he means the tongue becomes the conduit by which the evil of the world comes to expression in us. We look at and we see all this evil in the world, but what we don't realize is we're bringing that evil right into our own lives and into our own mouths by the way we speak. When we complain, when we lie, when we brag, when we gossip. You remember the story I shared from the movie Doubt a few weeks ago about gossip? Gossip is like gutting the feather pillow from the rooftop. The wind carries the feathers all throughout the community and you can't get them back. And there's no way of knowing just how far those words traveled and how much harm was done. And he says that the tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, polluting our whole body. And then at the end, there's all this judgment language. This is frightening stuff. Staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, set on fire by hell. This is judgment language. The person who is characterized by evil speech, characterized by the worldly, unrighteous speech, this person is on the path to judgment, James says. Now, what about all this hell talk? Come on, Dylan. You're an, edu you're an educated man. You got a PhD for crying out loud. You really believe that stuff? I do. I know it's unfashionable, outdated, some of you might say. But I believe the afterlife is real. I believe in heaven and I believe in hell. And I believe that because the Bible says a lot about that stuff, and I believe the Bible is trustworthy. So I take this judgment language very seriously here. The person who is characterized by evil speech is on a very dangerous path, James says. And then he goes on and he, he introduces this profound problem. And what I hate so much about this part is he doesn't give us a solution. He introduces this profound problem and he just leaves it hanging. Here's what he says. Every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. Look at what mankind can do. But no human being can tame the tongue. No human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So here's the profound problem. James just told us, those who are characterized by evil speech, those with untamed tongues, you're on a dangerous path. You're destined for judgment. And now he says, no human being can tame the tongue. No human being can tame the tongue. And he just leaves it hanging for a while. No solution yet. He just wants us to think on that. And he has one more thing to teach us. We've seen how the tongue can destroy others. We see finally how the tongue discloses the heart. How the tongue discloses the heart. The end of our passage, with it, with the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. I can't think of a, a more powerful way of putting it than to say it like James does here. With the one mouth that you have, 
how dare you bless God and then curse others? How dare you bless God, your creator, and then curse those he has created? Brothers and sisters, these things ought not to be so. We gather in this place on Sunday mornings and we pray for the salvation of the lost. And then we damn the driver who cuts us off on the way to lunch. These things ought not to be so. We sing praises and worship our Lord and Savior. And then we go home and we shout at our children. These things ought not to be so. We affirm the truths of Christianity. And then we lie to our spouse about what we were looking at on the computer. These things ought not to be so. James wants us to see that with this one mouth, we can't possibly have words of praise and blessing for God and then also words of curse, of lies, of deceit, of evil. In the same way that you can't have one spring that on one day gives fresh water and the next day salt. Or one tree that produces two different kinds of fruit. No, it doesn't work that way. James is trying to make the point that our mouths reveal so much more about us than we realize. I can think of two occasions where a person can get away with sticking out their tongue at someone. The first one is a child on a playground. I mean, that sort of behavior is just kind of expected, right? Little kid sticks out his tongue to somebody else on the playground. You see it all the time. The other occasion, anybody want to take a guess? When you go to the doctor. When you go to the doctor, what is, what is the doctor or the nurse, what do they say? Stick out your tongue. Now, I have no idea what they're looking for. But there's something about the tongue that gives them an idea of what's happening deep down inside the body. That's biblical. Did you know that? That's biblical. Scripture teaches us that the tongue reveals what is going on deep down in the heart. Our mouths tell us so much more about us than we realize. As we wrap up today, I want us to do a little bit of an expositional pivot. Now, pivoting is a basketball term, but if you're a student of God's Word, you need to know this, and we're going to do it from time to time. We need to keep a foot planted in James 3, and we're going to pivot to another passage of the Bible to help us better understand what's going on in James 3. So we're going to pivot for just a second to the words of Jesus in Matthew 12. And here's what Jesus says about the heart and the mouth. He's speaking to the Pharisees. Listen to this. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person, out of his good treasure, brings forth good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, brings forth evil. Listen to this part. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. We tend to say that words come from the heart when we really mean them. When we're being sincere, when we're showing great affection for someone, it comes from the heart, right? Jesus takes issue with this idiom. According to Jesus, all words are from the heart. And words reveal the spiritual condition of the heart from which they come, from which they flow. And this is why he can say on judgment day you will give account for your words and your words will be the evidence of whether or not you truly belonged to Jesus. James has had a lot to say about our actions and how we live. And today he's made it clear that our words are included in that as well. It's not just our works that should give evidence of the fact that we belong to Christ, but our words. So again, how are you using your words? I wrote 100,000 of them in three years. We've spoken so many more. How are you using your words? And when we see what Jesus says here as well, we understand that profound problem that James introduced a few minutes ago, but he didn't resolve it for us. No human being can tame the tongue, James said. And if you can't tame your tongue, you're on the path that leads to judgment. So are we hopeless? 
is the situation hopeless? No, it's not. Because here's what James says. No human being can tame the tongue. Only God has the power to subdue our speech because only God has the power to transform the heart. And all of our words are coming from the heart. So as you look at your life this morning and as you examine your words and ask yourself, how have I been using them? If you find that you are characterized by evil speech, by deceit, lies, unkind words, then friend, listen. That's an evidence that your heart needs to be transformed. You can't tame your tongue, but God can transform your heart, and that will change everything about you, including your words. So the first thing you need to say today is you need to cry out to Jesus. You need to repent and believe in Him, the one who came and laid down His life for you and was raised and who will bring you the gift of forgiveness and the gift of new life. Salvation is a fresh start. Maybe some of you want nothing more than a fresh start. If I could just have a fresh start, that's what Jesus offers you. A fresh start today. Forgiveness and new life. A transformed heart. And others of us, as we examine our words, and we ask this question, how have I been speaking? How have I been using my words? James is not calling for perfect speech. But he is calling for a certain pattern of speech. When I lived abroad all those years ago in New Zealand, one of the things I learned is that the longer I'm around people, the more I begin to sound like them. You wouldn't know it now because we've been back in the States for far too long. But when we lived in New Zealand and we were among the Kiwis, the New Zealanders, I, Jamie, all of us, we started speaking a lot more like them. Our accents changed slightly. We picked up all kinds of new expressions that we'd never used before. People who have been spending a lot of time with Jesus, in God's Word, walking with Jesus, here's what happens. They develop a Jesus-like accent. A Jesus-like accent. Are your words, is your speech perfect? No, but there's a pattern. There's a pattern of grace and love and truth. There's a Jesus-like accent. Think about that. And let's pray together. Father, we ask you, first of all, to forgive us for the times that we have hurt others with our words. And God, I pray that you will give us the courage today to go to those people we've hurt and also ask for their forgiveness. I pray, God, that you will help us to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, Help us to think carefully about our words and the effect they will have on others because once we cut them loose, once we fly them out there, we can't get them back. Guide us with the truth of your word, God, and empower us with your spirit so that all of our works and all of our words would be pleasing to you. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.